And now we get to the fun stuff. So there are some activities that TDM researchers need to do which should be permitted in every country by virtue of the idea expression dichotomy, the exclusion of facts from the control of copyright, and the right of quotation. There are also activities that TDM researchers need to do that may not be strictly within the confines of these universal rights, that nonetheless should be lawful when viewed against the public and competition protecting focus of copyright's purposes. But yet you may not have an exemption for those activities within the universal exceptions that we've reviewed so far. The upshot is that the universal exceptions are not sufficient to authorize all of the activities that TDM researchers need to do. This may be true even where that activity does not appear to compromise copyright law's core objective of promoting the making of copies that can substitute for the work in the market. And unfortunately for us, the manner in which countries protect the interest of users in making non-competitive uses of various works varies significantly and often applies uncomprehensively. Let me start with some terminology. Mike Palmetto and I published a paper describing our user rights database and a paper with that title. And we put together in that paper a set of terms to classify exceptions. You can find that report on the PIDGIP working paper series at pidgip.org. We find it helps to think of exceptions as being general or specific, open or closed, and all of these factors along a continuum. By general, I mean that a single exception applies one balancing test, e.g. the test of fairness and fair use, to a group of different purposes. So fair use applies, for instance, to research, but also to criticism and review, education, and other purposes. So that makes that exception general. Specific exceptions apply to only one, or sometimes a couple of very closely related, purposes of use. So for instance, an exception may apply only to research or only to criticism and review. That would be, in our terminology, a specific exception. So now, in addition to being general or specific, an exception can be more open or more closed. And by using these terms, I mean that the exception applies to the full scope of protection. It covers all of the rights, reproduction, but also distribution and communication. It covers all types of works, literary and artistic, sure, but also media works, audiovisual works, cinemagraphic works. And it covers a use by any user, a researcher, but perhaps also a library, a research institution, a school, etc. If it's open along all of those terms, I refer to that as an open exception. And then you can have a fully open general exception that would apply that single balancing test to a use of any work by any user covering all of the rights and, like fair use, for any purpose. So a truly open general exception would include some kind of an opening clause such as or including before any list of illustrative purposes to make it clear that that general exception can apply as a true catch-all. It can apply to a use for any purpose. Now, a specific exception, for instance, one that applies only for a research purpose, can also be open. It can apply, albeit limited to this one purpose, to all rights, all works, and all users. So in our case, where you're particularly interested in research exceptions, those dimensions of openness may be what you're really looking for. Here is a map of the world based on how open their exceptions are to research purposes. So whether general or specific, we mark all open research exceptions in green. These exceptions apply to a research use to every kind of work, including the use of whole works and including the use of audiovisual works. They apply to a use by any user, including an institutional user or an individual user. And they apply to all rights, including not only reproduction rights, but also distribution and communication rights that may be needed to share works in between 
a group of researchers. In green countries, the law in the books appears to allow the same general scope for research that fair use permits. Now I say the law in the books because we haven't been able to delve deeply into the case law in each of those countries to see whether there is any decisional law that limits the application of the rights that they have on the books. But it is at least possible in each of those countries to interpret the scope of the research section parallel to that that's been implemented in the United States. So that's the good news. So let's turn to what I mean in respect of the different variety of user rights that I label collectively as green. So the first category of green rights on that map is general exceptions, and that is that apply a single balancing test like fairness to a group of different purposes that's either open, like fair use, or that mentions research specifically. So perhaps the primary type of general exception are also are often referred to as fair use, which you know, or fair dealing exceptions. So general exceptions are most common in, but they're not exclusive to, countries from the common law tradition evolving from the United Kingdom. Such exceptions often provide a kind of general defense for either fair use or fair dealing with respect to any protected use by any user of any work. The general nature, the general nature means uh, that it serves as kind of a catch-all, as a fallback when you all of these laws also provide specific exceptions. And in a sense, one can go through the specific exceptions. And if you don't find a protected activity within those specific exceptions, you can then go to the general exception and see if that more broadly defined general exception provides cover for the activity. So in the US and some other countries, the term for the utilization permitted by the exception is fair use. And use is the particular term there. In the UK and many other Commonwealth countries, such as Canada, the historical term for the permitted utilization is a dealing. But notice that use and dealing mean exactly the same thing. They both apply to any type of utilization of the work. That is, a utilization that implicates any exclusive right of the copyright holder. In other words, using the terminology that I used before, it is open to application to all uses or to all exclusive rights. That means, for example, that a fair dealing or fair use rights is generally interpreted to apply not only to the reproduction right, but also to the distribution and communication and other rights. So it can, as long as the sharing is fair, authorize sharing. You're more likely to be able to make an argument in such, in such cases, in such jurisdictions, that a sharing strictly between users, that is a, as a kind, type of private sharing, is fair because it meets the fairness test. It doesn't compete with the author in a market. So in this example, the Canadian fair dealing right is subject to a closed list of purposes. So although it's open to the full range of uses by virtue of the word dealing, it's not open to every purpose. It's only open to the, the fair dealing right here is only open to the purposes of research, private study, education, parody, or satire. And then there's an additional fair dealing right for criticism and review. And there's a couple other similar rights elsewhere in Canada's law. But the fair use test you see on the left before the list of permitted uses uses the qualifier such as. That renders that list open rather than closed. You don't have to be explicitly mentioned in that list to be authorized. To be authorized, what you need to be is fair. And that's what the multi-factor test below qualifies. So it is sometimes said based on this kind of comparison between fair dealing and fair use, that the difference between fair use and fair dealing is that fair use applies to an open set of purposes and fair dealing applies to a limited or closed set of purposes. But that's not actually true in all cases. So look at these two exceptions. On the left, you have a fair use right, and on the right, you have a fair dealing right. But if you look a little more carefully, is the Uganda fair use right open? It is not. It lacks the words such as or including before the list of permitted purposes. 
So although it uses the term fair use and thereby is open to the full scope of rights protected by copyright's exclusive rights, it would include reproduction and distribution and communication, for instance, it is not open to the full range of possible purposes someone might want to use a work for. It is open only to the purposes for private use and quotation, which is actually a very limited kind of general exception. Now look at the Singapore fair dealing right. Is it open or closed? It's open. It's open for any purpose. Now the distinction here in our cases is unlikely to really matter because most fair use rights and fair dealing rights and all of those I've just quoted on the previous pages apply to either a research or a private personal use which could qualify as a research purpose. But don't be fooled into thinking that fair use rights are necessarily broader or more open than fair dealing rights just because they use that term. The key open term signified by use and dealing means that they apply to all exclusive rights. And that's very important. You want to focus on that term within any exception. What that means is that it applies to all of the exclusive rights of the copyright holder. It can apply to sharing, in other words, sharing between researchers in a way that doesn't reveal those works to the general public. Now go ahead and mark that down. Fair use and fair dealing rights may authorize fair sharing. There's also general exceptions that are not fair use or fair dealing. So if you look at this exception from Indonesia, I would call this a general exception because it applies to a whole basket of different purposes. It applies one balancing test to that basket of purposes. The reasonable interests of the copyright holder must not be harmed. Now, note that it uses the term use to refer to the utilizations allowed. So again, that is applicable to all exclusive rights, including distribution and communication. Like fair use, it potentially applies to any work, including a whole work. The list of purposes you can use this exception is not open, it's closed. It applies for education, research, writing scientific papers and reports, criticism and review, but not every purpose. It, it lacks the words such as or including before that list that would apply it to potentially any purpose. But other than that restriction, which may not matter since it's so focused on research purposes, it's otherwise like fair use. You may make any use for a research purpose as long as that use is not harming the reasonable interests of the copyright holder. And to figure out what those reasonable interests are, you can very much follow the analysis that, that you've learned previously under fair use. Here's Thailand, a fully open general exception with a very different look but the same effect as fair use. Thailand simply makes the entire scope of the Byrne three-step test a general exception. Any act, i.e. all exclusive rights, with any work, including whole works, is lawful if it does not unreasonably prejudice the legitimate interests of the owner of the copyright. So again, that essentially takes the Byrne three-step test, which says that exceptions cannot harm the reasonable interests of the copyright holder, and those reasonable interests are primarily in the avoidance of market competition, and makes that the full scope of the exception. It limits copyright protection entirely within the core purposes of copyright protection. Any use that does not invade the, co the core com competition protection purposes of the right is lawful. And that's a similar analysis that can be used under fair use. Here the Republic of Korea combines the Thailand approach using the three-step test as the multi-factor test with the fair use multi-factor test. So it states abstractly in the first clause that if you do not, if a person does not reasonably prejudice the author's legitimate interests, uh, a use may be allowed. And then in determining whether that version of the three-step test is complied with, it uses essentially the US fair use factors, the purpose, character of the use, the type and nature of the work, the amount of uh, substantiality of the use, et cetera. <clears throat> 
So I mentioned at the outset that I have also labeled in green in the map specific exceptions for research that are sufficiently open to apply to the use of all works and apply to both reproduction and sharing rights. So here's one of my favorite examples of a highly specific yet very open research right. Here, Lichtenstein incorporates the same broad protection for a use, so as think fair use, all exclusive rights, it applies to any work, including whole works, and by any type of user. But it's not general. It applies specifically to a research use here. The lack of generality in this case is not a drawback for your interest, though. Research is likely broad enough to define all of the activities for a TDM research project that you want to pursue. Some of the specific exceptions for data mining are also open-framed. This is one from Japan that's often held out as a model. Notice it applies to any exploitation of any work in any of the following cases. So that's indicating that it's a closed list of purposes that follow. But by any user. And the test, and I love the test, is as long as that use is not for enjoying or causing another person to enjoy the ideas or emotions expressed in the work. Now that translation may have come out a little funny, but I really enjoy that translation from the sense of, uh, of copyright's purposes. If you're transforming the work, if you're using it for a different purpose than that for which the work was intended, it would fall into that general category, much like the transformative use right within the United States. Uh, and so this right specifically includes the exempted purpose for data analysis, which many of you may be engaged in. Other research exceptions, although not open to every use, nonetheless specifically make provision for both reproduction and sharing. So Luxembourg here explicitly allows communication to the public to the extent justified by the purpose. That would seem to authorize, for instance, limited sharing between researchers. Germany makes similar provision in a recent law focused specifically on text and data mining, allowing to make the corpus available to the public for a specifically limited circle of purposes for their joint scientific research. As we'll discuss below, most current TDM laws in the EU do not make this provision, and the EU directive does not require it. So at bottom, this is a review of all the exceptions we have labeled as green in the map I showed you, and we'll show you again. These are laws that, on their face at least, appear to authorize reproduction and limited sharing between researchers of all works by any user for a research purpose. They are all susceptible of following the holding in the Google Books cases that a non-expressive use of a copyrighted work, one that's not divulged to the general public, which would be involved in a text and data mining project, should be permitted because they do not make the kinds of competing public copies of works that invade the market of the original. In the next section, we'll start to add some caveats.